Welcome, everyone, to this um, conversation with Tariq Ramadan uh, on the topic of Muslims and in the West. I'm really delighted to have him here at um, Columbia. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the uh, why he's here or who we are. Um, I'm Catherine Ewing, and I'm the director of the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life on campus. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit, since we've got you here, I want to tell you a little bit about the Institute before we begin our program, our conversation. Um, the IRCPL brings together an interdisciplinary group of scholars and students to support analysis, research, reflection, um, and response to historical and contemporary issues um, pertaining to um, the changing role of religion in the modern world. Um, the Institute was founded in 2008, um, and we engage in um, a number of different kinds of programming, um, bringing religious and cultural leaders, as well as scholars, journalists, um, and um, people from all over the world. Um, we try to take an expansive rather than a restricted view of religious thought and practice. And um, in, in the, with the goal of recasting the traditional opposition between the secular and the religious that way, in ways that promise innovo innovative approaches um, to the issues, uh, very familiar problems that we face in um, today's world. So we encourage faculty um, to submit proposals for working groups, research, uh, conferences, and speaker series. We also support research at all levels um, of students. Um, so we encourage, op we have open competitions for student fellowships and student targeted activities. And I just want to mention a couple of our upcoming events um, that are pertain to issues involving Muslims. We have on um, April 8th, uh, 7th, April 7th and 8th, we have a um, conference on surveillance and the mosque. So if you're interested in that, um, please check our website for the details. Um, and then the following week, we have uh, a conference, a two day, another two-day conference on April 13th and 14th called um, Intimacies, Exploring Sexualities in Muslim Communities and Contexts. Um, so as I said, um, you can talk on, virtually all our staff is here right now, so please feel free to talk to any one of us um, if you're interested in either of these. Um, but now I will turn the mic over um, to soon to be Dr. Hassan Azad who will introduce everyone and moderate our discussion. Thanks for being here, everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm not going to take up much of your time here. You're here to mostly listen to Professor Tariq Ramadan. Very quickly, um, as most of you probably already know, Professor Tariq Ramadan is Professor of Contemporary Islamic Studies at Oxford University. And he also teaches at the Oxford Faculty of Theology. He is visiting professor at the Faculty of Islamic Studies, that's in Qatar, and the University of Malaysia, uh, Perlis, Senior Research Fellow at Doshisha University, Kyoto, Japan, and Director of the Research Center of Islamic Legislation and Ethics. He seems to do a lot. He, he holds an MA in philosophy and French literature and PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Geneva. In Cairo, Egypt, he received one-on-one -on -one intensive training in classic Islamic scholarship from Al-Azhar University, from Al-Azhar University scholars. And he has ijazat, um, these uh, sort of cert certificates of uh, allowing him to teach s uh, seven disciplines. Through um, his writings and lectures, Professor Ramadan has contributed, contributed to the debate on the issues of Muslims in the West and Islamic revival in the Muslim world. He is active at academic and grassroots level, which is a very hard thing to achieve, I believe, 
uh, at both those levels, lecturing extensively throughout the world on theology, ethics, social justice, ecology, and inter interfaith and intercultural dialogue. Again, he's very active in all sorts of disciplines. He's president of the European think tank, European, European Muslim Network in Brussels. Uh, and finally, I just, uh, that's about his bio. I just wanted to very quickly say, I personally have been uh, convinced that uh, every Muslim should really read Professor Ramadan's works. I've benefited tremendously uh, from his writings for, for many years. And uh, in these days of increasing uh, uncertainties, to put it mildly, for Muslims uh, in the West and globally, I think uh, Professor Ramadan's voice is uh, even more important. So that being said, uh, please help me in welcoming Professor Ramadan. Thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation and this introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here for many reasons. One of them is to be able to speak uh, here at that venue in the, la, la, the Maison Française. I have to come to the States to be able to speak in a French venue. <laughs> and it happened exactly the same in, 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 in the UK because uh, there's something which is very strange. Over the last uh, 11 years, I was unable to speak in any French university. Ban and no way to speak in the country of the human rights and freedom of expression. And if you are listening to me right now, you'll ask yourself why. The point for me is I hope that it's not only for Muslims to read what I'm trying to say, but also people of other faiths or with no faith and agnostic and atheist, because I think that what we are trying to tackle here, it's our common future. When it comes to Western Muslims, and I started talking about this, not Muslims in the West or Muslims in Europe, it's Western Muslims. The way I'm looking at myself, I'm Western by culture and Muslim by religion, and there is no contradiction. The starting point here is to ask ourselves, as students, as teachers, as citizens, where are we going together, not where I'm coming from. And the point is now it's time for us to respond to populists, to Trump and others around the world in something which is a commitment and a deep understanding of what is happening. So when it comes to past, present, and future, let me just uh, highlight a few points. It's very important today when it comes to Western Muslims to deal with the past, with de with de to deal with memory. Why? Because we have two problems. The first problem is this perception that uh, the way we are to tackle the issue is the West and Islam. It's as if there is no Islam in the West and nothing coming from the West in Islam, which is completely wrong. If you come back to people have colonized countries, but some scholars colonize history and memory. By the way we look at Western philosophy, and the first PhD that I did was in Western philosophy, and my PhD was on Nietzsche's philosophy, it's as if you can get a PhD in the West and you know nothing about all the other civilizations and cultures. Nothing. It's as if you are to able to speak about Aristotle and you don't know that Aristotle came back to Europe and to the West through the Islamic input and not only translation, but understanding and comments, even transforming, even the Aristotle that we knew in the Middle Ages in, in Europe was not Aristotle, was Aristotle reinterpreted by Ibn Rushd and so many others. So, so the point here is there is a kind of perception of our history that we are neglecting a very deep contribution. And then we come back here and we say, OK, what about Islam in the West? I'm sorry, come back to history and get it right. When it comes to the history of thought, when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to sciences, when it comes to arts, Islam is already there. Not only this, many things in the Islamic tradition are influenced by the West. You can't take El Falasifa, all the tradition, El Kindi, Wal Farabi, Wal Ibn Rushd, all these people were influenced by the Greek philosophy. The West is already there. And not only this, these philosophers and falasifa in Arabic is to, it's taken from philosophy, it's the word, so they are Arabizing the word, are, are, are having an impact on the legal scholar. 
for example, to the point that in the, 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 the 14th, 13th and 14th century, somebody like Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, we have to get rid from the Greek logic, meaning it's already inside. So we are we having the, this. So, so the starting point of our discussion, if we don't have this memory, we are ending up now buying into this rhetoric coming from this simplistic st binary uh, vision and the simplistic statements that we don't have values in common, or we don't have shared history and shared memories. So that's the first problem that we have when it comes to the past, and we have to be serious about this. And to be serious about this is for every one of us, students and teachers, to question our own ignorance about that. That's the starting point of what do I know about my own civilization to say we versus you. And exactly the same, the problem that we have with many Western Muslims that even uh, uh, they are buying this narrative by saying uh, there is a problem here. So this is one problem which is essential here. And I'm not only talking about philosophy, I'm talking about uh, the history of thought, but I'm also talking about arts, which is very important. Because when it comes to deal with culture, culture has to do with art and imagination. It's not only the language you speak and uh, the values that you have. It has to do with your imagination, with your taste. And if you come to this and say, you know what, there are lots of things coming from Islamic cultures, there is one religion, but many cultures, it's already in the West. And where are we going to see this? By coming to Europe, for example, and saying, you go to Eastern Europe, to do, you go to the Balkan, and you speak to the Mufti of Sarajevo. And you tell him, you know what? We want you to be a European Muslim. And say, are you kidding? I have been, and we have been Muslim for centuries. So the way you look at us, it's patronizing. You are cutting Europe in Western Europe, a developed, developed countries, and Eastern Europe, where the Muslims are not even acknowledged. Islam is part of the European uh, continent and the European history for years and constructing. And not only this, we, we, we ourselves as Muslims, we are neglecting the very deep contribution of scholars in Eastern Europe. For example, in Sarajevo, at the university, at the Islamic university that you have there, who are producing very interesting uh, 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 thoughts dealing with the European culture and the European uh, context. So this idea that uh, there are European Muslims it is just new for the people confusing Islam with new migrants and not getting a sense of history. So the starting point here, which is very important, is the prerequisite to start the discussion. I'm not going to start the discussion by and accepting the statements made by some that Islam is new and now you have to acknowledge the fact that uh, you have to adapt to a culture which is not yours because we are cutting uh, the presence from history. So this is the first starting point, and it has to do with a scholarly input. And this is where universities, students, when it comes to our society, should come with this input to decolonize the way we deal with our own history and our memories. And on this, the theories on decoloniality are very interesting, because it's more than political. It's intellectual. And it has to do with history and memory. So this is something which I would say we have to start with. And uh, it's not done. And it's not done enough. And it's not deep enough in this understanding. Very often when we want to speak about this, we are making the big mistake, which is to start with colonialism. And it's a mistake, because colonialism is the starting point of this conflict between us and them. So if you don't get the deep connections, for example, in philosophy, and the people are coming to you and say, you know what, you have a problem with the rationality, you have to study Descartes and the doubt in Descartes, they say, okay, you might have to read El Ghazali. Because El Ghazali, many centuries before Descartes, was talking about exactly the same. And we know today that Descartes read El Ghazali. But you read Descartes, <laughs> neglecting El Ghazali. So the point here is, is deep, and it's a deep uh, scholarly resistance that we need to have on this. The second point, which is important, is the steps that we had with the new presence of Muslims in the beginning of the 20th century. And there is something new. We cannot uh, deny the fact that there is something new. And for years at the beginning, and I myself, I wrote this in the introduction of the book Radical Reform. And there is a book that I wrote at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, called To Be a European Muslim. 
and saying what? The new presence of Muslims, and mainly we were talking about new migrants, new residents, and new citizens, and we kept on talking about the second generation. So after now, we are still talking about that. 70 years later, the second generation. We are reaching the fifth. In France, it's even the fifth. But we keep on saying young and second generation. Young, they are always young. The Muslims are, by definition, young Muslims. <laughs> And they are second generation. And when we spoke about them as citizens, we say, with an immigrant background. So my father was British. My grandfather was British. I'm British. Second generation with an immigrant background. The psyche, which is the, behind this uh, way of describing it and describing the people, is creating the other. Is creating, yes, but you are not completely uh, European, you are not completely American, we have exactly the same in this country. And now it's becoming more, you know, for years I thought that you were going to be protected by what is happening in Europe. The problem is that now you are colonized by the same rhetoric. It's coming now and it's a very powerful way in the United States of America and even in Canada. We are, I, I am hearing things in the States and in Canada I never heard before. And this creation coming with the same background. And it started by people from here speaking about Europe by saying, Arabia, these countries are colonized by Muslims and colonized by migrants. And now we have having exactly the same rhetoric. So now we have to get, uh, uh, and to get it right, we are facing exactly the same challenges. Four years, the first question was, OK, you are new citizens, you are new residents. Prove us that you are going to abide by the law of the country. Meaning that it was a legal issue. And why this is important? Because coming from an Islamic tradition, the legal tradition, what we call al fiqh Islamic law and jurisprudence, was essential. Is, am I allowed to be a citizen in this country and to stay here? And you have to respond to the legal question with legal arguments. And this is where the Muslim scholars in the United States, in uh, Canada, in Australia, and in European countries made the most important contribution on the legal by saying, you can be a citizen. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we had scholars saying, you can't. This is not your country. Your country of origin are your only country. So don't take the nationality. Many people were saying to young Algerian living in France, or Pakistani people, or Turkish people in Germany, don't get it. This is, these are not your countries. They changed because the reality on the ground was telling them, you can take the nationality, and you abide by the law of the country. And the fact was that coming from the Islamic tradition, what we had is, OK, the question is a legal question. So in fact, with the legal question is, how much do you acknowledge the power of the state? Because the state is an institution with the law. So legal and political. So this was the first step. And what we had, and this is what I explain in, in To Be European Muslim, showing that how much the Muslims were trying to give the right answer by saying, you can be a citizen. There is no contradiction between being a, a European and being a Muslim. Abide by the law of the, of the country. And when you have a conflict in the name of your conscience, conscience, you have to take a decision. And there were very difficult questions, for example, in the 90s, in the 80s, the 90s, and up to 2001 about being involved in the army, for example. Am I allowed to go and to kill Muslims? And some were saying you, yes, some were saying no. Uh, and I'm saying it depends. <laughs> I will come to this question if you want. but. Uh, Yes, it depends on the principle. I'm not going to, to say, you are not Muslim, so I'm going to kill you. You are Muslim, I'm not going to kill you, which is what one of the answers coming from scholars. Muslim scholars say, if the people are Muslims, you can't do this. If they are not, you go for it. <laughs> I say, no, the question is about justice and the right thing. So there is something which is conscientious objection, even if it's, it's against non-Muslims or people of other faiths. You don't do that. And you have to question your involvement within the society. So it's a question, an ethical question. It's not a, a question of, like some scholars were saying, you, want, you need to show to your fellow American citizens that you are a good American citizen. So go and kill Avrani. No. 
I'm not going to kill Avrani just to show that I'm a good American. I'm asking what are you doing and what exactly the same as we are all celebrating Muhammad Ali and so many Christians, by the way, he was not the only one. He was the most visible one, but so many were saying, I'm not going to kill Vietnamese because you are telling me that I have to kill them. This is against my ethical position. I have nothing to do uh, with the war that you are launching. So the point here was a legal thing. Very quickly, what I want to, to, to show is just, in fact, there was a shift in the discussion. At the beginning, we, say, we are talking about, are you going to abide by the law? And then the people were saying, OK, now I'm a citizen. I'm voting. I'm in, in, into, integrated into the society. But what happened, which is very important, and it's now happening in this country as much as it happened in Europe, is that, in fact, the success of the legal integration the success of the legal integration on the theological ground, people and scholars saying there is no contradiction between being a faithful Muslim and being a committed citizen made that with time you have a new visibility of Muslims. In fact, the success, they are all now saying it doesn't work. And I'm saying exactly the opposite. It worked. It worked on the legal. So millions of Muslims don't have a problem with the state and the law. The problem is not in their life, it's in your perception. Why? Because the success made what? Go to France. Look at what is happening in this country here in the United States of America. Is that they were in ghettos, they were in inner cities, or they were in the suburbs, and with the success, they get out of it. And they are more visible. So yesterday, they had a legal problem, but it went OK because they were invisible. They solved the legal problem, and now they are visible. And the problem is the new visibility. The fact that in our streets, when I was in the Netherlands, talking to people, I was working at the municipality uh, uh, and uh, with a connection with university, and I was talking to people saying, look at, the, uh, look at this street. This is no longer my country. Why? Because the Muslims were visible visible out of being and settling down, being now part of the society. And then the discussion was not about the legal. The legal was OK. So now you say, I don't have a problem. Even myself saying to the French you know, government, I don't have a problem with the secular state. Just implement it in an equal uh, uh, way. Just do what you do with Christians and Jews and Buddhists the same way you are doing uh, with Muslims. This is what we want. Don't become like, like Sarkozy was for a while, the mufti of the Muslims. Telling them that when there are uh, riots in the suburbs, just issue a fatwa saying it's not Islamic. What is the point? <laughs> and you know what? The crazy thing is that the Muslims issued a fatwa. <laughs> so who, where is the mufti now? Sarkozy telling them this is the way you have to deal with the riots. And the riots had nothing to do with Islam. The fact is that they Islamized the social problem. And that's the point, that the second step was not about the legal. You solve the legal, and then you come, and the people are telling you, you know what we have between you and me? It's not a problem of the legal framework. It's a problem of value. And then we had what happened in 2001 here, in 2005 in London, and the people are talking about what? Britishness, Dutchness, being an American. These are our values. So now it's a conflict of values. Yesterday, the legal was the problem. Today, the values are the problem. Because there is a new visibility. So the only way you are going to tackle the new visibility by saying you have a problem with our values. And this is something which is really a problematic. Because in fact, we talk about the nation state. Yesterday, the problem was, was with the state. Now it's with the nation, the narrative, the us, the perception that your visibility is making you a foreign citizen. You can be a citizen, but you are visible in a way which is making you not having the same citizenship as mine. So we have a new category now of uh, people looking at you. And it happened to me with the UDC. The UDC is the far right party in Switzerland looking at me, acknowledging that I am a Swiss because I have the passport, but not really a good Swiss. <laughs> I'm too much a Muslim to be a good Swiss. The fact is that my values are undermining my status. So you have a new status. What uh, uh, Schenkel? Uh, the uh, Dutch uh, sociologist is calling the moral citizenship. There is the good citizenship and not, not so good citizenship. And the Muslims, by definition, have 
a tainted citizenship, not a trusted citizenship. Why? Because their values are not our values. And you take everything which has to do with radicalization and all this process. I don't have time to talk about this, but there is a huge discussion to have about radicalization. When just the, the, the fact that we talk about radicalization and you look at facts and figures, how the people are involved in violent extremism, it has nothing to do with religious radicalization. Religious radicalization means that yesterday you were moderate and now you have become more and more radical. In fact, the people, to, one week before, they were not even praying, they were drinking alcohol and they were partying. And to the point that what happened in Nice, the people were saying, it was a very quick radicalization, overnight. <laughs> doesn't work. There is a problem here in the way we look at things. Even this, we sometimes are Islamizing the problem. So the point here is that with the new presence, the new visibility, the answer was to Islamize the social problem, to Islamize unemployment, to Islamize the fact that there is no uh, uh, equal school system helping the people in the suburbs or everywhere and then you end that because you don't have a policy to say I have it. So the, the, the answer the answer is your culture is Islam the problem it's not that we don't have a policy we don't we are not uh, working on uh, helping the people to have the same opportunities so transforming the political discussion into something which is a conflict of values who are the best on this the populists and they are dealing with four characteristics, which is exactly what happened with Trump in this country. And by the way, Trump is just only the, 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 the visible voice. At many levels in this country, what we have now is people being free to speak exactly the same. So this new way of expressing, and it's about what? The first one is a binary vision. You are American, but not like us, so it's us versus them. This is one. So it's a dogmatic way. We are right, or we are American, so you are not exactly American. You are not really Canadian. We are not really European. So this one. The second is about emotional politics. We are not talking about the vision. We are not talking about social justice, unemployment, gender equality. We are talking about emotional politics. It's, it's about uh, uh, reacting by saying you play with the emotions of the people. And the third characteristic, this emotional politics, has to do with fear. The people are coming. They are colonizing us. We are losing our identity. Based on two things, the more you talk about fear, the more you make it clear that we need a security policy. So what you are going to do with the inner cities, what you are going to do with the black people, what you are going to do with the Latinos, it's a security policy. This is what we need. We don't need more social justice. This is ideology. The real fact is these people are threatening us. So this is the third point. And the last point is to nurture something which you see, and it happened, you know, this is what uh, uh, George W. Bush said straight after uh, uh, September 11, was saying, we are the victims of these people because they don't like us. It's the victim mentality. Victimhood. It's we are the victims. Whatever we do, we don't ask about the foreign policy of the Americans today. You don't ask about what the French are doing in Syria. You don't ask about what we are doing with migrants and refugees. We are the victims of radicals and violent extremists. And we are victims, potential victims, of their silent colonization. So you take these four characteristics and you look at what is happening now in Europe and in the States and in Canada, you can see that it's moving on the populist discourse. So what the Muslims have been doing by saying, we abide by the law, we are citizens, at the end, the success of their presence by being visible end up being foreign citizens, not part of the narrative. It's not part of the nation. The nation is us, is Britishness, is Dutchness, is America first, minus Latinos and Muslims, and black. Black. That's, that's very deep here. We have to deal with this, which is how the whole discourse is being changed. So having said that, the, the, the last point that I wanted to make to open the discussion is this is happening now. And I would say it's not out of a failure of what was called integration. By the way, I don't use this term. Integration doesn't mean anything for me. And very often I'm saying to people who are talking to me and say, you have to integrate. Say, no, no, my problem is not to be integrated. It's for you to integrate me in your mind, to integrate me in your setting, in this us. And this is what I was calling the new we 15 years ago. The new we is you and me asking ourselves where we are heading together. Don't ask me where I'm coming from. 
Having said that, the last thing which is important is also to take the responsibility to understand when it comes to Muslims, and we are talking of Muslims and Western Muslims, there is a great deal, what I call the silent revolution, first, second, third, uh, fourth generations, and trying to do the job by answering some of the questions. Is it enough? It's not. It's not, and there is something here where, which is very important. The answer coming from the Muslims is also to fall into the trap of the victim mentality that they are facing. Our common problem is the victim mentality. So what I see now with Muslims and Western Muslims is also nurturing a sense of uh, victimhood. For example, I think that we have to be very clear that there is something called Islamophobia. But Islamophobia should be part of a policy, of a vision that we are not day in, day out, talking and reacting to racism, but to have a vision to go beyond that. There is no way to resist Islamophobia if the Muslims are only responding to racism against Muslims. What about racism against the black people, against the Latinos, and all type of races? So the notion of transsectionality is essential. And the Muslims don't get that. To the point even that their response to this it's even to acknowledge within, and I was yesterday with some leaders of some of the movement at the grassroots level, that they are not connected between immigrant Muslims and black Muslims. And they keep on speaking about our brothers and sisters. Yes, but let us talk about the American dream. Because some of the migrants are buying the American dream to the point that they are dismissing the black reality in the inner cities and in jails in this country. So here there is something which is deep in our discussion is that the answer coming from the, the Muslims today is very often superficial and acknowledging this victim reality and transforming it into victimhood. This is one. The second is that too often the citizens, the American citizens, the European citizens, the Muslim Western citizens are only visible when we speak about Islam. And they are not visible, and not enough visible, when we speak about everything. We have to talk about education in this country, health care in this country. We have to talk about the environment. We have to talk about gender equality. And to get rid of this discussion, you know what, I'm free to wear the headscarf. That's fine. What is your opinion on same skills, same salary when it comes to women? Let us talk about serious issues. Let us talk about equal opportunity when it comes to the labor market. This is where we should be. And not only to, oh, you speak about Islam, I'm here, I'm a Muslim. And you know what? I'm nice. I'm not a <laughs> radical. That's not going to work like this. That's, that's a serious question here, which is to transform the whole narrative to be the we that I'm talking about here, to go from the legal to the national, to the narrative, the common narrative, means that we have to be involved in everything when it comes also to culture and arts. The best integration we have when it comes to the nation in, in, in two fields. Entertainment, music, and sports. That's it. Basketball, soccer, and rap. There you are in. You are true American. But when it comes to scholarship, when it comes to university, when it comes to, to the contribution, the intellectual contribution, being able to speak about all the issues, if you are real, really American or Canadian or European, we should see you everywhere. When it comes to all the issues in the country, in order, this is the best answer to the populism that we have today. So I would say that uh, from a very deep discussion on history and the past, from a deep discussion about uh, uh, the, the shift between the legal to the ethical and the values, and the creation of the other, this otherness, it's manufactured. And we know it's working. And it works. Even among students, even among teachers, it works. It's very powerful. You have to deconstruct. You have to be able to understand the way it works and the way the things are connected. Because all what I'm saying here, we are not going to solve the problem of Western Muslims if we think that the West is not connected to the world. 
if, for example, I have something to say about Africa, I have something to say about the Middle East. If you, don't, if you want me to be a true American, not to connect to the thing, as I'm told sometimes coming to the city, you know what, speak about us in the West. No words about the Middle East, no words about Palestine, no words, no words. And so this, you are colonized. You are not getting it. A true American citizen should be able to speak about everything. Whereas your principles, this is true citizenship in a critical way. And my conclusion here is that this is why we have to come together. This is why it's important for us in, on campuses, in our universities, to make it a field where we are coming with very strong scholarly studies and uh, a connection between university and the cities. You know, I don't care about being in Oxford or coming to visit Columbia. If at one point this is an ivory tower and you are not connected to, world, to the world, you are useless, wherever you are professors and students, if you're not connected to the reality, if in this university you don't have a narrative being able and to be powerful to face racism in our country, it's useless. It's just to get degrees. It's not to get this understanding that we have to be connected. And I would say that this is one of the topics that we have to be involved in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ramadan, for an extremely uh, stimulating and thoughtful uh, talk. Lots to think about and ruminate on and take back with us. Um, I would like to now welcome. Oh, are we sitting at the table? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pretend that didn't happen. Um, Catherine Pratt Ewing is Professor of Religion and she is also coordinator of the Master of Arts program in the South Asia Institute. Until 2010, she was Professor of Cultural Anthropology and Religion at Duke University, where she served as the Executive Director of the North Carolina Consortium for South Asian Studies. In 2010 to 11, she was Professor of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison before moving to Columbia's Religion Department in 2011. Her research ranges from debates among Muslims about the proper practice of Islam in the modern world to sexualities, gender, and the body in South Asia. In South Asia. She has done ethnographic fieldwork in Pakistan, Turkey, and India, and among Muslims in Germany, the Netherlands, and the United States. Her books include Arguing Sainthood, Modernity, Psychoanalysis, and Islam, Stolen Honor, Stigmatizing Muslim Men in Berlin, and the edited volumes Shariat and Ambiguity in South Asian Islam, uh, and Being and Belonging, Muslim Communities in the US since 9-11. And I uh, just wanted to quickly add, uh, on a per more personal note, um, Professor Ewing has been my mentor at, uh, at Columbia, and uh, you know, I've benefited tremendously from from Professor Ewing's erudition uh, and remarkable mentorship. Um, and I'm personally convinced that everyone should have her as their mentor in some capacity. <laughs> Thank you, Hassan. I'm not sure I need everybody. That'll be. <laughs> but, um, and thank you, um, Professor Ramadan, for a um, very stimulating talk. Um, I have I've read your work um, for many years and have particular reactions and thoughts, things I've pondered on um, that I think touch on what you just said, but also coming from my own um, particular angle. And um, one of these is um, thinking about the issue of culture. And you have a phrase that, uh, a phrase that you've made um, well known, um, Islam is not a culture, which I think has been picked up by many young Muslims, to <laughs> use that phrase, um, but young Muslims. Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> and um, by, by Muslims um, often, Muslims living in the United States and Europe, as well as in other parts of the world. And um, this, is something that from a 
the perspective of an anthropologist is a little bit hard to understand, or I've talked to anthropologists who say, well, you know, everything, that every human practice is cultural. Um, and yet, this phrase has been really, um, I think, significant, and has, I think, had a lot of positive um, effects or positive sort of force for people who have um, drawn on it in their own lives. Um, I think it's been, for example, important for Muslims thinking about how to be Muslim in the modern world. I mean, it seems really clear that um, it frees up. Uh, so, so when second generation Muslims, and I know that there are third and more now, but for second generation Muslims especially, where their parents um, practice Islam in ways that are different from what might be comfortable um, for, say, a Muslim whose parents came from Pakistan um, and do things that, you know, or think about Islam as something that um, involves practices that just don't quite feel comfortable. Um, in an American setting. So you know, young people are going to school and learning uh, how a, a certain kind of orientation to the world and then come home and are, say, embarrassed by their parents, for example, which is a common second generation phenomenon in, in all ethnic groups and not peculiar to Muslims of various backgrounds. Um, so, um, and it's, I think, most women have often used this idea um, as a way of separating out what they think of as Islam from some of what they have called, um, you know, the patriarchal practices that they want to identify as the local culture and separate it from, from Islam. And I think that's part of what you've hmm. thought about in relationship to, or I mean, maybe part of what you mean by it, but I'm gonna ask you in a second. Let me just say a couple more things and then. Um, and yet, and, and I also think that it's maybe been a way that you've um, thought about universal principles. So some of the universal um, principles that are advocated in certain forms of secularism that are sort of the, the sort of bedrock of constitutionalism and such. Um, that, and I, I know you've said in various um, places, that are consistent with your understanding of Islam. And where there are sort of conflicts between these universal principles and certain other practices that one could perhaps call those cultural and not Islam. So that might be another way of thinking about Islam as not a culture. But um, I guess I've also worried about the, some of the unintended consequences of um, not necessarily how you're using it, but how it sometimes gets used. Um, is there um, a way, and I think it comes out of this initial uh, problem of, you know, is there something that's not cultural about one's practice of Islam? So I think what happens is that sometimes there's a slippage between um, sort of rejecting local cultural practices and embracing other practices that are considered sort of somehow more Islamic and yet maybe from another perspective, are just as cultural, but are so, have somehow become dominant or hegemonic. Um, so for example, when I was in Pakistan um, back in the 70s and 80s, I don't think anybody had heard of the word hijab. Uh, and now, I think you know, people look at like, how could that be? <laughs> but, but amongst the people that, that I knew, people never talked about hijab or wore 
um, a dupatto or a headscarf in in a particular style that is that is now identified as hijab. So somehow, for some people, this has become the proper Muslim way to do things. It is part of Islam and not cultural. You see, so, so certain principles or certain practices get universalized, um, and there's becomes so the, the question comes down to kind of intra Muslim affairs in some ways so uh, how does what are the effects and how do you think yourself my having sort of raised these sort of thoughts I've had about it um, how do you think about the term is the phrase Islam is not a culture and do you see kind of complex and perhaps sometimes troubling effects of this kind of universalizing principle. Thank was, you. Thanks. I hope that wasn't too complicated. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Do I have to respond or you mean? Uh, no, I think please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for these are two difficult <laughs> questions and, and complex reality. Ma the phrase that I'm using to make uh, my point, or to try to make my point clear, is uh, there is no religion without culture. Any religion is going to be experienced in a specific culture. At the very beginning, when it came, for example, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, uh, and then it's, it's within a culture, right? So that you can't just get religion without the cultural dress. So there is no religion without culture, and there is no culture without religion. When you look at all the religion in one way or another, whatever is the reality of secularism within a society, there is something which is coming from somewhere, from a, a specific religion or a dominant religion in history. So there is no religion without culture, there is no culture without religion, but religion is not culture. So that's the phrase that I'm using. It's not exactly the same. You can't have one without the other, but we have to try to differentiate what is religious and what is cultural. And what I'm coming and I'm trying to do and I'm saying Islam is not a culture, is that wherever you go throughout the world, go to, from Senegal to uh, Indonesia to the, uh, 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 all the way through uh, the Middle East, you have some principles that are the same for all the Muslims. The principles. So for example, Wherever I go, I speak about the Tawheed, the oneness of God, which is the starting point of everything. We agree on that. The five pillars of Islam, we agree on that. The fact that we have to fast, this is, these are principles that are transcultural and uh, they have an impact even in the spiritual communion. So when we speak about Ummah, an Ummah, in fact the Ummah is the spiritual communion. It's what brings us together as a community that uh, uh, wherever you go you feel that the pillars or the fundamentals and the principles are the same. Now, how is it going to be translated? This is going to be influenced by the culture. So the universality of Islam is not to uniformize the culture, it is to get the same principles with a diversity of cultures. So there is something within universality which is an accepted diversity. An accepted diversity in three levels. In the way you read the scriptural sources, so interpretations, so I don't agree with people saying the sociologists in the way, so, so we'll come to the anthropologists just after that, but the sociologists <laughs> saying, uh, <laughs> saying uh, uh, they are Islams, I'm saying no, be careful. There is one Islam, many interpretations. You don't speak about Christianities and, and Judaism. You speak about Judaism, and then within we have interpretations. So we have different interpretations, and we have to acknowledge this, starting with the fact that one of the main challenges that we have today is the relationship between Shia and Sunni. So going from uh, political disagreement to religious rejection, which is very dangerous. This is what is happening now. But this diversity is there. So we have the first diversity of interpretations. You have diversity of schools of law and trends. In the last book that is going to come, it's already uh, published in the UK, but it's going to come in September, which is, I was asked after, after 35 books to try to write a simple introduction to Islam, <laughs> which is really complicated. It's really, this is what I did. But to be simple and, 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 and accessible, 
on, with deep uh, questions, and, and especially in the atmosphere that we are experiencing now, it's quite uh, challenging. And I, I'm, I was just also talking to Muslims as well. I'm talking to people who are of, uh, from other faiths and other uh, backgrounds to say, look, you have to get it right from within that there is a diversity of schools of law, schools of thought, and trends. So this is the second. And you have a third level of diversity, which are cultures. So Islam is not, uh, and I keep on repeating this to the, uh, to the Arabs, is that Arabic is the language of the Quran, but the Arab cultures are not the cultures of Islam. There are many other cultures, so the diversity. Why is it important this? Because what I'm saying is that when I come, I'm a European by culture. There are much more, in a way, values that I find in the Western culture that are consistent with my principles that I find in the Arab cultures. So sometimes I'm closer to Islam as to some of the principles when I live in Switzerland than when I am in uh, Saudi Arabia. Well, I can't go anywhere, but that's the point is. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that it's true. So here you are saying something which is to deconstruct the thing. Your question is an important one was, where, where, are, where is the limit? How do you know that it's cultural mm -hmm. or it's uh, religious? And this is an open discussion. For example, the headscarf, with all, almost all the traditional scholar, it's part of the, an Islamic principle. The way you are going to wear it could be cultural, but the way that you have to wear it, it's, it's a principle. So by the way, even in Pakistan, at the time that you were going, it was already there for many, I think. I think it depends. Well, by, probably by, by the 80s. I, I think I probably misspoke. In the 70s. Okay. I really didn't. But so the, the point is that you, yeah. you are right on one thing, is that depending on the political situation, sometimes it came and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and went, and it, mm -hmm. it, it was. And even yeah. in, in, in African countries, it's already yeah. there. And sometimes, and depending on the influence of the Salafi yeah. uh, or some uh, uh, organizations. And, but I should add, though, in Pakistan, it's not that women didn't cover. Uh, there was the burqa. There was you yeah. know, total covering in certain settings. But that particular form. OK, yeah. so, and that's true, because this is where also the influence could be. So, so the fact that, for example, uh, you can, if you say, for example, it's an Islamic principle, and you would say, for example, in the Western culture, you try to find your way to wear it. That's fine. That's, that's up to you. You don't have to take the Saudi way, which is the black way, of, uh, or the black color. It's, for them, it's only black, which is Islamic. Uh, not in the way of, yeah, anyway. So, so uh, the point is that you have to acknowledge the fact that there is something cultural in the way you wear it. And now some, it's a minority, but it exists that we have it, are saying, but this is even the, even the, 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 the headscarf, it's cultural. So they took it as something which is a way of reading the scriptural sources. So there is not a, a great disagreement among the scholars, but there are some voices saying this, and we, we cannot deny that it exists. So this is one question. And the last thing that I, I wanted to say about that is uh, I really think it's essential uh, to differentiate between what is cultural, the cultural dress, uh, in many fields. First is how are you going to feel that you are Muslim, depending on the environment, and by saying the fact that you are Muslim with the principle should help you to take from the surrounding culture everything which is in agreement, in accordance with your principles. So, so you are very positive to the diversity of culture. I want to change the mindset of people thinking that by definition, when it's Western, it's against Islam. It's wrong. It's, it depends on the principles. So, so this positive thing is, uh, and which was the beginning of Islam? The beginning of Islam, why Islam was spread so quickly, it was to take, you know, from the Chinese, from, from all the other traditions the, 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 in, in India, they were, uh, they were very integrated. Why? Because they were making a difference between their principles and other cultures, and they were taking from other cultures and other uh, uh, universes of reference. And I think that this is something that we have to, to do, and we have to keep on questioning the limits. What is really cultural and what is and there are even discussions that are deeper than that. And as you were working on gender, in the book Radical Reform, I took all this about, uh, for example, what was very positive in the fact that wherever you go, when you look at a culture which is not your cultural origin, you have to be positive and to take the positive of it. The problem is that this is very positive as a, a dynamic, which is accepting in the name of your principles this diversity of cultures. 
What is problematic is when the culture is taking uh, precedence over the principles, as we have with women, for example. So the fact that you are open to culture and up sometimes to be jailed, imprisoned into a specific culture. So this is mm. the discussion about patriarchy and everything. Mm -hmm. So this is we have to challenge that. And I, I say I, I think that we have to challenge it in two ways. To try to differentiate between what are the principles and in which way it was read in a specific history uh, through the cultural lenses. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is I really think, deeply think, that women are reading the Quran not in the same way as men. I, I deeply think that it's not only a question of culture, it's a question of what do you see in the book. Because when you are a man and you think about women, as I keep on repeating this, you always think about the role of women, not womanhood. You can't speak from within. You, you speak about, let me say, say something about uh, women as the mother, as sisters, as daughter. But women as women, the being, the spiritual, the liberating spiritual message. You can't speak about the social status if you don't start with, start with the liberating spiritual process of being a woman in a society. What, what, what does it mean? And then you speak about the social. If you start about the social role, you are, you are, you are forgetting the, 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 the liberation process. And I, and I think that this is important. My next book is the Manifesto for an Islamic Liberation Theology. And it's part of it is this. It's part of it is this. It's really how do you get the, the, the deep understanding here. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, with this, the last point that you make about the universality of, of, of principles, I'm very cautious with this. In a book that is not read, neither by the Muslims and people of other faiths, they don't read the book because some are saying, the Muslims are saying it's not Islamic, it's philosophy. And others are saying, why is he talking about philosophy? He's, an, uh, the, you know, he's a Muslim intellectual, so he has to speak about Islam. It's the book, The Quest for Meaning. And in this book, I'm talking about the universality. On this book, I'm trying to say the, the only universal values that we have are shared universal values. So I'm not buying anything which is saying it's coming from the West, it's coming from Islam. It's, right. These are shared universal values. So let us come to this discussion. And from here, I would say that uh, uh, um, we need, we need to, be, to be involved in this discussion and to avoid making something cultural uh, something universal. And this is why with Olivier Roy, when he spoke about globalized Islam, he's falling to the trap of the Salafi. The Salafi are telling us the way we read the text from an Arab perspective in a literal way is the universal way of being Muslim. These are very dangerous people because they are reducing the text to their cultural understanding and this is not acceptable. Of course, it happens too with um, Europeans or Americans promoting liberal values that are interpreted in culturally very specific That's ways. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, I agree. I agree. It's exactly the same process. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to now introduce Professor Brinkley Messick. Professor Messick specializes in the anthropology of law, legal history, written culture, and the circulation and interpretation of Islamic law. He is the author of The Calligraphic State, which was awarded the Al Albert Hurani Prize of the Middle Eastern Studies Association and co-editor of Islamic Legal Interpretation. His scholarly articles include Indexing the Self, Expression and Intent in Islamic Legal Acts, Written Identities, Legal Subjects in an Islamic State, Genealogies of Reading and the Scholarly Cultures of Islam, and Textual Properties, Writing and Wealth in a Yemeni uh, Sharia Case. Professor Messick's new book, Sharia Scripts and Historical Anthropology, will be published by Columbia University Press. Um, and on a slightly more personal note, he is, um, <laughs> he really, he's a remarkable teacher. I, I'll keep these, I started something, so I'll continue. He's, he's really a remarkable teacher, and he hasn't paid me to say this, but uh, with incredible breadth of erudition, and I'm always uh, touched uh, whenever I speak to him by, um, uh, by, his humility, which is quite unusual in a, in a university like ours at Columbia. <laughs> I was going to say something. This, this, 
This is functioning? Oh, yes, yeah. it is. Uh, thank you, Hassan, uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, at least you're not sending a, a horde of students my way. <laughs> um, I, I, want to, uh, uh, I want to say a few things about Columbia University, actually. Uh, but first, I want to extend my welcome uh, to Tarek Ramadan uh, from the Columbia community, especially on behalf of the Middle East Institute, which I direct and that community of scholars who work in Islamic studies and in Middle Eastern studies, who cross many disciplines and many departments and even other units. Uh, and, and it's about a scholarly tradition that has existed at this university, a very distinguished tradition that goes back to the 19th century. Columbia has always been a, a leading voice in the study of the Islamic tradition, and uh, we are very actively keeping that alive as I speak. Um, just to one little note here about uh, Columbia also is, as you all know, the place where Edward Said lived for and taught for 45 years. There's a very active critical streak in Columbia that makes this academy uh, a, little, a little different in its history, and a place in which but nevertheless, the academy is always a place of contestation and has to be realized once again in every juncture, what the academy can be and what its role can be in, uh, in the wider politics of the country and the world. Um, just on the subject of intersectionality, I, I would just note, uh, I, I immediately, immediately came to mind um, the Palestinian movement, a student Palestinian movement on campus, uh, produced a, a whole series of, of events around the connection between Palestine and the events there and Ferguson. In other words, between uh, Palestinian issues and Black Lives Matter. But that kind of intersectionality is, is what has to happen. I think that, that message is very well taken and it's something that we have seen at Columbia. To, to, um, to begin to pose a question, um, I want to quote the opening lines of the second chapter of his book, um, Western Muslims and the Future of Islam. Um, this is a chapter on the way, a sharia. He writes, in the West, the idea of sharia calls up all the darkest images of Islam. Repression of women, physical punishments, stoning, and all other such things. It has reached the extent that many Muslim intellectuals do not even dare to refer to the concept for fear of frightening people or arousing suspicion of all their work by the mere mention of the word. He goes on to say that this is the central notion in the Islamic universe of reference, the Sharia is. Um, he goes on to provide a very instructive, very concise, very technical actually, but very accessible chapter on the Sharia, which uh, I'm interested in the state of that discussion. This was from 2004. And my question really is about the state of play in speaking about teaching about Islamic law. Um, the, as, as you all are pretty well uh, informed about uh, the Islamic State and others have done a whole, many, many heinous and criminal acts uh, have been committed in the name of the Sharia. And, and so the, the, the name is it tarnished much more so than I think it was the case in 2004. And in this country in particular, it, this is true elsewhere as well, the Sharia is stigmatized in public discourse, both in, in, uh, in the movements of Islamophobia, which are very developed and which take Sharia as a leap motif of, of what is evil in Islam, but also in state legislatures across the country, uh, places such as Oklahoma, where the, the state legislature uh, provided a, a law a legislated to ban Sharia from use by judges in that state as if they would have. <laughs> at, Columbia, at Columbia, the Sharia is studied uh, by specialized faculty members, by graduate students and undergraduates in courses on Islamic law in three different departments. I think this is probably unusual in the world. Um, and, and there's also a version being taught now at Union Theological Seminary, which is our close neighbor right down, down the road. Um, and we have instituted recently, actually for the last two years, something called Sharia Workshop, which is designed to attract scholars both at this university and in other New York universities. And people come from the University of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and come from Princeton and from Yale. Uh, this is a very growing field. Uh, uh, Islamic legal studies is a growing field. And the study of the Sharia, naming it as the Sharia, is a vibrant field at this university. And so um, my, my question again is, what is the state of play 
in in this field, in this topic, in this this massive world of of, of scholarship by Muslims over the course of more than a millennium. Uh, it's, but it's not only that scholarship, it's also the records of the archival acts, the court records. For example, the Ottoman Empire, there are thousands of registers in ex extent for uh, Ottoman jurisdictions for all around the Middle East, to as far south as Yemen and into the Balkans. Um, there are a lot of very interesting topics that in my own work, I'm very interested in questions of, of procedure and evidence and truth in, in courts. Courts are maligned. The judge has been a, a joke for American uh, jurisprudence. Qadi justice from Max Weber down to the present and, and a lot of uh, American justices of the Supreme Court have even spoken of the, the Qadi sitting under his tree as if he was a primitive who was a, a, unqualified, un, unaware, had no technical kind of apparatus, had no rules of procedure, had no rules of evidence. Uh, this is a, a world that is still in, in search of a, a good book. Also, one of my interests is also in property. One of the strange things that strikes me is, at least strange, is that well, while Western capitalism is all centered on individual property, individual ownership, that kind of ownership, that kind of individual property ownership and its ramifications was true of Islamic jurisprudence a thousand years ago and has been continuously true of it so that you also get notions of capital, you get notions of a commodity, you get notions of trust such as family trust as we're familiar with in this country or even public trust such as the Ford Foundation. All these institutions of property are, are interesting, instructive and they have ethical and moral dimensions that are instructive and important for us. Anyway. I, I, I just want to give you uh, the subject of the Sharia, please. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much. I, I, I think that, once again, uh, uh, we are facing around the world, and of course, what is happening today with Daesh and Boko Haram and, and uh, the so-called Islamic State, uh, but not only. It's very negative, the perception of implementing Sharia is negative. Uh, but this was here even before, before Daesh, uh, with all what we had with the Sharia bill in 22 uh, uh, in, uh, US states. And, and what was behind the whole philosophy of pushing that way, making Sharia uh, a dirty word, and a word that is just showing how much the Muslims are alien to the reality of the country. And I think that this is what we, from within academia, we have to resist. And what you are trying to do with the workshops and, and, and all this, this is essential. We need now, I, I, I keep on repeating this, there is also colonization on our terminology. So I have people saying, you know what, in order for the Muslims now to be uh, uh, trusted, they have to avoid talking about jihad. So you are not going to be able to, to, to avoid jihad in the Islamic terminology. You can't do that. Sharia, you can't avoid the term. And there are lots of terms that we have to read, to study, and to be able to come with the complexity of their specific definitions. Because in your field, in the legal Sharia, it's the reference to the legal tradition, which I think when it comes to the mysticism, for example, the tasawwuf, Sharia has another meaning. So what, in the, in the last book, I'm, I'm giving the, the different definitions that we have in different fields. Which is important, why? Because from within, what we have to do is to resist this uh, negative understanding of the notion to show the richness and the, 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 the very long tradition, as you were saying. It's just, it's completely neglected and it's really patronizing and sometimes really uh, uh, just show how much the people are ignorant about the very long tradition. So we have to make it a, a, a scholarly topic and to reconcile the people with the complexity of the Islamic legal tradition, for example. The problem that I have from within as a, a Muslim scholar is very often what I'm dealing with and with some Muslim scholars is that they are reducing the legal to procedures and not being able to show that behind the legal there is a philosophy of law. Sharia has to do with this. So I want this background back. I want to reconcile the Muslim thinking with the philosophy of law, which is there in all the, with all the great Muslim 
uh, uh, jurists, for example, the fuqaha, are all dealing with a very specific methodology. We come back now to understand, for example, with the Shatibi uh, and the Maqasid, that there was a philosophy, because he put it clearly, he said the Meccan period is the, the, the overall uh, principles in Kulliyat, and then you have the translation of this in the second period, and and he is just making it clear: you cannot get the objectives if you don't get the El uh, Kulliyat, and then the legal is means. But my point is, and I think that this is what we have to do: is to be able, for example, to say something uh, about even Sharia in the United States of America, but not in the very narrow legal thing. For example, I said this, this is in the book To Be a European Muslim, saying the fact that by law it is said all the citizens are equal in the country, it's my sharia. It's in integrating the principle into something which is a legal tradition, which is also inclusive. Everything which is good in, the le in legal terms, you can take it. I think that this is missing. The complexity is missing. The teaching that you are doing, it's essential. But I would, I would suggest, this is my point, that uh, I you know, I'm trying to deal with what are the crises that we are facing as Muslims within our own tradition. And the uh, centrality to the point that it became the only priority of saying the legal is essential in the Islamic tradition is problematic for me. So the philosophy is low, is not there. Philosophy as such. I am now, you know, in the work that I'm doing on ethics, all what I'm doing, and even with the liberation theology approach by saying, to what do we have to, how do we have to understand the, the use of the legal within a cosmology? So I want to reconcile the legal with the philosophical. But I also want to reconcile the legal with the ends, the goals, the maqasid. Not at the price of the legal, because this is also a problem. People are coming with the, the objectives and they are forgetting the, you know, they are, the rules are not so important. Let us talk about the goals. And, 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 and I think that we are experiencing a crisis here. So I would like to come to a deep discussion about Sharia, not only on the legal, but also facing the internal crisis the Islamic scholarly tradition is facing today. Why is it, for example, that the legal is becoming so important? Why is it that in the United States, the people who are now reaching the people are talking on two things? They are uh, uh, promoting tasawwuf, and at the same time, madhab. So the very narrow legal belonging to a Shafi'i or, or, or uh, uh, Maliki, you are in a very specific, so, so it's uh, putting something which is a clear legal framework by saying, and it's also a spiritual thing. So reducing Sharia to something that, that for me is very problematic. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there are two things, is the way we talk to the society, how we have to deal with this in a critical way, what you are doing and, and in which way we have to respond to this distortion of our, our notions. But I wouldn't do this without understanding the challenges within. So, so, and this is where we, we, we need to work together. I, I'm, I'm now bringing in all what I'm doing, for example, in ethics. I want people of other faiths to be with us, discussing the perception they have of the Islamic notion. Because they can see and see things the Muslims are not seeing in the evolution of thought. That's very important. This is where it's the, 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 the con it's a very important contribution into this discussion. So this is the way I see it in the West. Just want to say, you know, in I, I th the problems of the present um, uh, with the colonial <coughs> transformations of Sharia, reductions of jurisdictions to just family law, you, you lost a uh, sense of all the, the criminal law, the property law, all these things all sort of disappeared as if the Sharia is only about the family. It's about everything. The, the chapters of these books are amazing. And, and for, in the historical materials, the, in my view, there are lots of uh, wonderful things. And, and the first, one of my pleasures in working in this field is the imagination of the jurists. They imagine, they think, they, you can see them reasoning. They will dream up hypotheticals. They will dream up problems. There's an incredible juridical imagination, which is always also ethical. And that's, that's on the level of the, the doctrinal works. Then on the level of the court records, you see it, uh, the incredible problems of people in society, actual problems that people could relate to, litigations. How do you run a murder, a murder trial? What kind of evidence can be in that trial? How do you trust witnesses? How do you deal with falsifying witnesses? These aren't just uh, Islamic 
phenomenon. These are these are worldwide phenomena, and and so and how people deal with their properties, how families fight over the wealth of the of the patriarch. These are things that are going on in Texas and they're going on in Marrakesh. Uh, and so there are things to be learned about the history that will inform this present. Uh, where, where the present, it's, you know, there's, it's much reduced. Your chapter isn't reduced. Your chapter is very rich, very full, this chapter two here. And, but, but a lot of the present day discussions about what Sharia is, is something that's very atrophied. Uh, the, the spirit is lost. If it's, in a, if it's made part of a constitutional kind of order or a nation state, it's inevitably subordinated. And, but it wasn't in the past necessarily, and it has their riches to be in touch with. I, I agree uh, and I disagree on one point. When you said, and this is why I'm saying from within it's important, when you said it's very rich, the legal tradition, in what it was always ethical. And I think it was not always ethical. That's the problem that I see. The answer of Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyya, for example, responding and saying, we have a problem, for example, with al-Hayyal, is the way the tricks that you are. This is part of our tradition, that sometimes the legal was so important that it was legal at the price of being ethical. It's also in our tradition. I think that sometimes it's, it's, the, the- These are legal stratagems. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it can be positive even with them. Uh, but I have a problem with some jurists that sometimes they are very much in jurisdictions and, and playing with rules. And I see this within our tradition. Why well, I'm saying this? Because it's not coming from nowhere. What I see today with some, for example, coming the Salafi, the literalists, they are very, very tough and very, sometimes very bright with the rules. You know, now you have people, the people who are thinking that the literalists are ignorant. That's not true. They know the text and some of them are very bright. But the way they are able to reduce the whole thing into a set of rules, at the price of the ethical, at the price that you don't ask. For example, you know, we have, it's, it's in our life. The problem that I have with some jurists, when they talk about halal meat, for example, halal meat is the way they are reducing this to a set of rules, not even considering the way you treat the animals. The ethical way you deal with life is problematic. So we have this in a very old tradition. And some of the scholars had this intuition. So I said, I, I completely agree with what we are saying. And I would say, we have to be cautious not to make our tradition only a legal tradition no, no, based no, no. on this. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm very quickly, very quickly going to pose a question before we open up the, fo the floor for questions from the floor. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the, the issue of halal meat, and uh, my question revol revolves around ethics, which is something, of course, you're very interested in. Um, you, you mentioned in a recent article in The Guardian um, that uh, rather than Islam requiring a re reformation, what is required is for Muslims to reform their minds, which I, I really appreciate it and appreciate. Um, and this sort of, for me, ties uh, to the very question of uh, bringing the Islamic ethical project, as it were, for want of a better word, uh, to foreground it rather than to forget it. Um, Muslims don't talk, by and large, I have yet to meet many, uh, about animal welfare, animal rights. Is it actually okay to, to eat factory farmed meat? I mean, as far as I can tell, there's no way of justifying it based on the Islamic tradition that I know. I don't think the Prophet would approve of it. Anyway, uh, relatedly, um, what, what do Muslims, are Muslims thinking, uh, for instance, of uh, some issues that many people think are science fiction still, but these are areas in which uh, there, there are literally billions of dollars being poured right now as we speak, areas such as artificial intelligence, radical human uh, modification through technology. Um, these are questions that have to be grappled with now, uh, you know, and, and not wait until it's already a reality on the ground. And I wanted to, to hear your view on, on those things a little bit. Yes. I, I, I once again, this is exactly where I am now in my work. In the book Radical Reform, I was saying in the introduction that I reached limits with the work I have been doing in fiqh, because my training was mainly about fiqh, and, and this is what I was coming from, usul al-fiqh and fiqh, which is low interest jurisprudence and the fundamentals. And I was trying to solve the problem of the, the, you know, the contemporary Muslim majority countries and the Muslims in the West by thinking we have to promote an ishtihad with new, and I still think that we have to do that. 
the problem that we have is that uh, we have a deep crisis of authority within the Islamic tradition. And we have a, a, a very deep crisis of something that is crossing the board. It's even happening in our universities in the West, which is this fragmentation of knowledge. We are very specialized, and there is no transdisciplinary. There, there is, but not in all fields and not the way it should be. And I think that what we have today is that we have scholars, when they deal with Western issues, for example, they come with fatawa, legal opinions, by telling us, you can do this, you can't do that. And you just realize that they don't know the environment. They don't even know what they are talking about, or they have a report. And it's exactly the same with all our councils, that uh, they got a report on the economic things. They don't understand the complexity of the global economy and say, is this halal? And they end up telling you about halalizing the means and not questioning the goals. So some are telling you, you know what? Islam is regulated capitalism. That's it. <laughs> So you took, uh, and that's it. So they are not questioning the whole structure and even the goals. What is economy? How do you, do you deal with this? Exactly the same with, with uh, medical science. And now we are dealing with a very deep question about genomics. Mm -hmm. is, is the DNA and the whole uh, 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 knowledge that you are getting out of this. We need applied ethics. And applied ethics means what are the values that we need to have. So what I'm trying to do in the center, for example, Islamic legislation and ethics, is to bring together scholars of the text, so the traditional ulama, and scholars of the context, medical doctors, or, or artists in their field, or uh, journalists, or uh, economists, and to bring them together. And not only Muslims. I want people of other faith, or people who are, for example, we, we, we uh, ask uh, Bichon to come, you know, on the, the principologist on, on biomed, uh, bioethics. Mm -hmm. And we bring them and say, okay, question, because we want the scholars to understand that they don't get it. It's not going to work like this. And we have to, to deal with these issues at different levels. So we have some answers, and the field where we are ahead is the medical field. You know why? Because this is the only field, the, 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 the shuyur, just have to acknowledge that they don't know how it works. <laughs> they know that they are ignorant. They don't know. So you know, you have people saying, tell us when we consider from a medical perspective that somebody is dead. What mm. is mm. Uh, death in medical terms? Mm. So the scholars, they need this. So, mm. so for, for more than 35 years, they have been working together. My take on this is that we can't have but collective ishtihad. So, mm people coming from different fields and working together, which is applied ethics. And to get the knowledge from people who might have the same ethical concerns, even though they are not Muslims. Right. And they are questioning the, 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 the thing by saying, this is what is happening now. Uh, but we are very far. So I have been working on this now for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And my first conclusion is going to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know why? It's not only that you bring the people together around the table. They don't speak the same language. Right. They, they, these are two universes. You see, see. So one is talking about you know the complexity of things. So, so, so it's very difficult. It's it's a long process of education, re-education, in order to be able to reconcile the three things which are important. So this is why I I, I, I want to recapture the very essence of, of Sharia, for example, by saying it's the relation and the reconciliation between the ahkam, the rules. El akhlaq the ethical reference, and el maqasid the objectives. Mm -hmm. And to understand that the rules are but means between the principles and the values and the goals. How are we going to reconcile all this and to come to a critical discussion within, which is a shift in the center of authority in Islam, mm -hmm. which is also something which is not really liked by some of the shuyukh today, right. like what I am trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do exactly what you feel I'm trying to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Much needed. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we'll, we'll take some questions now from members of the audience. So uh, the gentleman with the glasses um, raising your hands. Do we have a mic? Um, yeah. you can, people can speak up. Oh, OK, yeah. Well, wh why don't you stand up, please, and just uh, pose a question? Sure. Um, thank you for crossing the ocean. Um, my question is um, about a tradition that I've often heard for um, uh, frequently in mosques and literature and discussion threads. Uh, it's a hadith tradition um, in Arabic. Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum 
Uh -huh. or whoever imitates a nation becomes one of them, which is a hadith tradition that many Muslims, um, scholars and lay Muslims have used to say that Muslims must be different. Um, and it's associated with many other hadith traditions um, that argue uh, that Muslims should not imitate Jews or imitate Christians. In other words, should c cultivate a, an identity of difference. So um, I was wondering how you believe or how you think Muslims um, in the West, in other countries, should interpret this tradition when, when cultivating um, their Muslimness, their, their being in the world. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's a very interesting question because we are here at the center of something which is taking a, a prophetic tradition and reading it literally. So what it meant here, if you go and you imitate the people to the point that your culture is making you lose your principles for your, so you are one of them. Because the other thing is, coming from the Quran, they are asking you what is permitted for us. What is good is permissible for you. Which came from an Islamic tradition saying it means the principles and everything is permission. So whatever I see in you, which is good, I'm going to take it. And there is a, another hadith, which is, he was, it was very much used, but in fact it's a weak hadith, yes. Uh, it's that wisdom is the last property of the Muslim, whatever he or she finds it, it's his or hers. So it's weak, but the principle is exactly what we have coming from the scholarly tradition. Everything that you have in a culture, which is what happened with the Prophet, in Mecca and in Medina. When he arrived in Medina, he didn't do, no, avoid all this. Even with singing, singing, he told the people, the Ansar, they like singing during the marriage. So trust, bring the two singers. He was acknowledging a culture here, saying, this is them, so let us do what they do, as long as it's not our, against our culture. So I think you cannot just take one. It's what is called in the scholarly literature a dawaban, which means the point that you are living as the others to the point that you are losing your principles, so you become like them. But as long as your principles are clear, and then you can take everything which is good. So in intellectual terms, it's very simple. You have a good idea, it's mine. You have a bad idea, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> very simple. And you do the same with anything which has to do with the culture. I, I look at all the drinks here, I'm going to drink everything except alcohol, because it's not me. I have a problem, by the way, with Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> because of, you know, the, the economic order and the way they are fighting, you know, cultural and, and local uh, drinks. I'm, I'm very upset when I go to Africa, very far. Yeah. And the only thing that they give you is water, it's Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola. Say, what's that? Okay, so 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 I'm making things haram for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I have special, special fatwa. But that's a very that's a very important point that you are making. Is is exactly the mindset that we get coming from Salafi literalists. They take this and say you have to be the other. The only way to protect yourself, your strength is in the difference. No, the strength is in your principles. Is you belong to the principles and you take the good from wherever it comes. I think this lady had a, had a just here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramadan. It was very interesting uh, speech. Uh, you mentioned that religion is becoming a culture. Uh, what I witnessed and lived some of the Middle Eastern Arabic country, religion was not a culture. I mean, it, I mean, people celebrated their Eid, meaning the Christian, their Christmas and Easter, the Muslim, their um, their um, Adha and al Fatr, which is exactly the same. It was not really a culture. I think this is becoming now because of the rise of terrorism in that region, which I really think this is what it is. I mean, it says, I know it in some of the Arabic country, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. You could go there. I mean, people mixing with each other. So maybe it is, it is this what we have to deal with. And we have to bring, we have to deal also now with this, which I really is heartbreaking, 
the animosity between the, sector, the sects in Islam? And how do we deal with that? Yes, quite quickly. Thank you on, so much. Thank you. Quite quickly on this. I, I don't think that it's only coming after you know, terrorism and violent extremism. By the way, even with this uh, situation, we have to be quite strict with the terminology that we are using. Uh, you know, I was talking about radicalization and even terrorists. I think that uh, you know we we came to an agreement at one point with the British government just after uh, 77, talking about violent extremism and to be very cautious about the way. And then they changed again the, the way of uh, dealing with it. But I don't think it's only coming after that. I think that there is there there always. Uh, 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 was a, a, a reference to uh, something which is cultural. And even in the way, for example, I'm traveling a lot, I'm talking to different audiences, I can, I can feel the, 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 the cultural dimension of their belonging to Islam. Even in something, you know, I have a, a platform, for example, today on, on Facebook, you cannot just realize the way the people are reacting, it's very cultural. You can see that some of the issues are, there is a cultural reaction. So to say that uh, Islam is not a, a, a culture was not a culture. Islam was always perceived from a very specific viewpoint, and, and you go to Pakistan, you can feel it. In fact, even in, in, in here in this country, you go and you know the the inner city have a culture. It's not the same like the uh, the immigrant in this country. There are specific there are things that are completely different. The way you deal with the dynamic within a culture it's also different so you have cultures within a culture even that you have to take into account and it's connected to the social status it's connected to the relationship with power it's connected to so these are things that should help us not to simplify the the, the reality of uh, of uh, the cultural thing and even if you are not a muslim for example you were talking about uh, about edward said edward said when we we were together the, the last time uh, no this was the the, the one before the last time. In 94, we were together. And he was telling me, you know, I am a Muslim by culture. He's a Christian. I'm a Muslim by culture because my, in Egypt and in Palestine, everything was about, there is, there is Islam in my Arabic culture. So it was rooted there. So he's a Christian, and at the end, he, he was an atheist. But he was saying there is something I'm connected by. And, and I think that we have to, it's true. I understand what he was saying. I understand the way he was feeling about this, and uh, and it could be also that you have uh, uh, the perception in some countries that the, the the Christian cultural impact is playing a role. Yes, of course. So, so I, I wouldn't say it's just coming now. Now, what is happening in this is another discourse on identities and clashing and conflicting identities, which is a bit different. Is the way you use the culture and the religions to construct the other by putting him or her outside. And I think that this is another discussion. It's another discussion about, uh, so this is why I, 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 I agree to a certain extent to the anthropologists. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's somebody over, over there that I have uh, I think I saw your hand earlier, um, the lady, just, yeah, yeah, so just the lady there in the second row. Um, Salaamu Alaikum, thank you for being with us. Um, my question is about what you spoke about in the very beginning of your talk. You had mentioned that there's a, there was a phenomenon of Muslims becoming more visible at a certain period of time. My question is concerned with uh, a fact that I see in that it seems that today there is uh, re Muslims are now wanting to somewhat either A, disappear, but not in the sense that they are withdrawing from society, more so in that they are hiding some cultural tendencies that they may have or pushing them down, or in what one of our peers said over there, wanting to be extremely different. And so it seems like there's a, a dichotomy that's really polarized in the way that Muslims have been dealing with their identity in the West. And it's not to say all, but I'm wondering if you could comment on the polarization and which you think might be more dangerous or harmful to Muslims and where you think that perhaps the m good middle path to bring a little Buddhism in there could be when it comes to forming Muslim identities in the West. Yeah. That's, that's a very important one and, and it's not an easy one because I agree with you. We, we see the two trends today. People 
being so scared to appear as Muslims that they want to disappear. And we have some scholars, by the way, telling them, disappear. So they are saying the people don't like really the headscarf, remove it. They don't want you to, 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 to be visible in the way you dress, in the way you speak, in the way you, uh, you have your, for example, the masks. So disappear. So the good Muslims is the invisible Muslim. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous as to the rational, what is behind this. Now, there is another tendency, which is what the Salafi are saying. You're not going to be liked in this country, so just isolate yourself, remain who you are far from the society. And it's also playing into what Daesh uh, wants. This is exactly what they want. They want us to feel rejected, and they want us to feel, and they want the society to feel that you're not going to make it with the Muslims. They are a threat from within. And some of our politicians are buying into this and nurturing this. So there are you know, mirroring rhetorics that we have here. The populists are exactly saying what Daesh is, wants them to say. And Daesh is doing exactly what is nurturing this discourse. What is the way forward then? The first, for me, it's really to get this right, that when you belong to a society, you don't only abide by the law of the country, you belong to the society. So I'm now talking, I was, I was at one, it, this was in the 80s, I was talking about integration of your intimacy. It's how do you, the, the, what I call now the sense of belonging. You belong to the society. And the sense of belonging is the way you have to think about your visibility within the society. So there is nothing wrong by being visible by the way you dress and, and, and who you are. Because at the end of the day, all the people are telling you, we don't want to see you. What are you going to do with your color? What are you going to be when you are black? What are you going to do when you are Latino? What you, that's not possible. We need to educate the people to deal with this visible diversity. It's an educational process. But to make it clear, the first thing, and this is why I, I'm saying to Muslims, be careful to push you towards Islamophobia and to be on the defensive and reacting to this. This could be a trap, because you are nurturing a sense of, the, I'm going to be respected for who I am, and that, then out of this victim mentality, not a vision. And the vision is, is exactly what I, had, I was trying to say before. It's a new way of being visible within the society. So I, I'm, I'm, the people are quite surprised that somebody like me is saying to the Muslims, please stop talking about Islam. Stop talking about Islam. It's a trap. Be a Muslim. Be Muslims out of your ethical distinctiveness within the society. But be committed with your values. Don't fall into the trap to put Islam first, because this is exactly what people want you to do, and to define yourself by disappearing as Muslims or being visible. But not to talk about Islam doesn't mean that you are not making your faith and your principles visible by the way you are going to be committed for social justice, environment, all the issues that are essential within the society. So it's for Muslims to be part of the social dynamics, but not only this. There is something which is essential. And you know that it is a struggle. You have a political struggle, but you have also a cultural struggle. And you know what is coming from Foucault and what is coming from Bourdieu about the cultural capital. It's essential. What is our cult cultural capital? I think we have to, to make it clear. Our contribution to the American culture is not only in entertainment and show business. It's arts. It's imagination. It's novels. It's movies. This is where we have to be. It's, this is how we are creating this sense of belonging. This is to be visible in areas where the people are surprised. That, oh, well, what are you going to do this? Why are you here? I'm here because I'm here. It's my home. It's my way of contributing. So imagination, it's the way what I was talking about. Where are the historians being able to say, what are you talking about? Let us come to this history. Let us decolonize this history and come with what is the West today. And to bring this, you have lots of people doing this, but where are the students who are doing this? So I would say the middle path is not a middle path of a kind of visibility. It's something which is much more demanding in intellectual terms, in social terms, in cultural terms. This is the new generation. People are saying, I belong to this country. The book that I started and I never finished, and I want to finish this book, is called Our West, Our West, Towards a New Narrative. And it's based on this. It's very much dealing with 
paradoxically less talk about Islam and more involvement of Muslims in all the fields is going to make it something which is the, the contribution. You know, I'm taking a very simple example, which you have to think about this. When you are contributing within the society, the people are not asking you, where do you come from? But when they feel that you are a problem, this is the first question. I'm always taking the Zidane example. Zidane in the French uh, soccer team, no one was, uh, except once, but no one asked him, where do you come from? Because he's pushing towards, and that's, psychologically speaking, this is where I would call the middle path. The new, I, I, I don't even call it the middle path. This is the path where I really think that the Muslim should avoid talking about being invisible. That's not the answer. That's the answer. We, we have a, a scholar in France saying, faire du affaire. So it's the, the Islamic law and jurisprudence of the 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 how do we uh, the weak exactly the weak people. So what's that? So you start by telling us that we are the weak. So how are we going to be equal if we start with this? And I, I think that this is very dangerous. Um, gentleman here from yeah. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Uh, you spot you touched on a lot of topics, but there was one thing, one thing that you said in particular I wanted to correct you about in regards to the treatment of black people since uh, the Trump era, we'll say. Uh, yes, Hispanics and Latinos are being targeted more with the whole thing with immigration, but African Americans, that is not like that. We still have our problems too. The thing that I wanted to bring up is the problem that we have within the community here. Uh, you made mention about uh, the creation of other. And what I find here, especially in academia, when it comes to African Americans, we are pretty much marginalized. So, I mean, in this room right here, there's only one face that I recognize, which is this lovely lady here, Sister Aisha Adawiya. But besides that, I, I know none of you in regards to the plight that happens, you know, uh, being Muslim and being black, because you're being black twice when you're Muslim and you're black, just so you know. So uh, just to tie everything back in uh, with what you were saying uh, in regards to, uh, to bridging uh, the cultures, you have people who come here, and when I say people who come here, I mean Muslims, who come here for uh, a better life and a better opportunity, and they're, they're told the same line that other uh, immigrants are told in regards to uh, upward mobility. So you have a situation like, I don't know if anyone remembers about uh, like last month, a lot of the bodega owners here closed their shops on Thursday to protest the, uh, the, tr the Trump ban. But were they closed on Friday to make Juma prayer? So it's like we have these, these cultural issues and we have these, I, I don't even want to say that it, that it deals with Islam because if you're open on third, if you're closed for third. Sorry, so what's your question, please? Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to, to, to uh, there's just a lot going on. But my question is, like, how can we bridge the two? Like, we have this, this serious uh, schism, and, and it deals with color to a, certain, to, a, to a certain extent when it comes to uh, leadership and things like that. How do we bridge this? Because we have this, there's a schism. I mean, it's like you have... Okay, thanks. I think yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to be long-winded. I, I cannot agree more with you. I, 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 not only I, I know what you are saying, I, I, I feel it when I come here. You know, my first encounter with this country was not coming with the migrant. Because with my family, my father, the connection with Malcolm X, the connection with the African-American and what he was saying, visiting my father, my father being in Harlem. He, he was, when he was coming here, he was not going to the migrant. He was not buying the American dream. He was dealing with this discourse from within. And when I started coming here, you know, I was going to Chicago and the ISNA convention. And at the same time, you have the convention of the black uh, uh, American at the same time in the same city in two different venues. Unacceptable. Unacceptable and meaning what? 
that the understanding of all what we are talking about here, the principles, the values, what we are talking when it comes to intersectionality, the understanding that whiteness and blackness is a reality in this country, and if you don't get the deep roots of this discussion, you are not even understanding what and how it is working with Muslims in this. And the Latinos, it's the same. So, so when I'm so talking, you know, yesterday and the day before yesterday, I was with, uh, with leaders of uh, Black Lives Matter. I heard many Muslim scholars, the way they are dealing with this issue is just, what's that? They don't get that. And you had some voices, two you know, uh, rare uh, voices in this country that are trying to say something. But that's the reality. You go to any Muslim uh, Islamic convention and you look at the, 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 the crowd and you can see the differences. You go in the mosque and you can see the difference. And we are very happy because we have one imam who is a black imam coming to our convention. It shows that we are not racist. And I think we have a great deal of racism. And then there is something which is important. It's not because we are brothers and sisters in Islam that the social status has no impact. You have today in this country migrants that in the fact that they are buying the American dream, they look at the disenfranchised. They don't even get the whole security system and the prisons and the jails in this country. They don't listen, they don't study, they don't have the memory of this country. And I think that uh, uh, their integration is in fact to please you know, the, 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 the common narrative or the, 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 not the common narrative, the, the narrative which is said by the government by saying, and you know, by saying, for example, we are very happy to have the first, we should not underestimate what was the meaning of the first election of Barack Obama. But we have to be serious about using symbols to avoid talking about procedures and processes and structural racism in the country. So I completely agree with you. And, and, and I think that this is something which is a very important. I would like to see this coming from our universities as well, this connection. And, uh, but the reality of it, the sad reality of it, is that students are exactly and in majority reproducing the same structural and the same fragmentation in their commitment. Yes, that, that's the reality of it. We have a problem of... Uh, so this is why I think that coming with this discourse about the liberation process is also to say, the only thing that I know about Islam, it's a liberation process. So we have to deal with the structural discrimination and races within the, the country. And for do, to do this, as much as we know the richness of our our legal tradition, we need to know the weaknesses and the mistakes and the unacceptable behavior of some Muslims dealing with slavery and, uh, and justifying slavery in the name of Islam. So I think that this is also part of uh, our tradition. And now people in this society looking at the black American Muslims as second class Muslims. This is happening today. And I think that this is not, of course, it's not right. Let me take a question from this side. Um, so I think I saw your hand up earlier, please, yes. Um, can you get the mic there, please? Thank you very much for a fascinating panel uh, talk. Um, Professor Ramadan, you mentioned one of the themes throughout your talk was the question of uh, colonization and decolonization. And I was wondering how you'd respond to um, academics and, and theorists such as Franz Fanon who argue that decolonization by its very nature is a violent process and so the response is one of counter violence. How would that fit into the narrative of decolonization which links to a point made by Professor Messick about Columbia University uh, being fairly progressive but at the same time the space that we occupy at the moment is built on land that was stolen from the Lenape people. Uh, we continue our colonization here by uh, gentrifying Harlem and Morningside Heights. And so how do we reconcile this paradox between the institution being a space for learning new ideas, new knowledge, but at the same time, we are culpable in the gentrification process and the continuation of colonization at this institution? So that's a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> I only, I, oh, not really, but uh, one little note. I mean, it's precisely a remark like that in a setting like this is what the academy is all about. And it gets answered, it gets responded to, it gets heard. And that kind of, uh, uh, that's, what the, that's what this place is, that's what the university is, that has to be continually recreated to 
push those questions, raise those issues, have those debates. But uh, we have an expert here. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I agree with this. This is very important. Because if we start by saying, you know what, there is a space where we can question and, and promote the critical, but we keep on repeating, but this place, by essence, is just the symbol of uh, a historical discrimination and co so we cannot end you're not going to, to do anything because you will find this everywhere the starting point is just to acknowledge one thing which is something that we should celebrate really to start with is the space where we can open a critical discussion now it's true that some institutions some would like us to stop at one point don't go too far in the critical thinking so the, all the discussion about freedom of expression is not the, the, the space where you are free, it's the limits. So who is putting the limits and how? And I think that what I see within academia today is that on these discussions, you can question. You, you can open doors and you can be critical. So you have to do it. And you cannot justify our laziness in questioning the limits by saying, yes, but there are limits. Yeah, but question them. No one is preventing you from doing this. So we have to do this, and it's an ongoing process, and we have to be vigilant with this. Why? Because today we have something which is coming in our country, for example, in the UK. We have a discussion, for example, on some pressure about our freedom of expression. When it comes, for example, in something which I think should be clear, that when it comes to anti-Semitism, we have to be clear. But we have now, coming from the government, telling us there is a problem with anti-Semitism. So when you discuss and criticize Israel, you are very quick to be uh, uh, labeled anti-Semitic. I think that this is where our discussion should be anti-Semitic. We have to come with a very, this is something which we have to be principled. Anti-Semitism should be condemned and no way in our institutions. But now to say, our criticism of a policy or a state is ending up you telling us that this, this is anti-Semitism. This is infringing in our freedom of expression. So what I'm saying here is no one is preventing you from doing this to question the limits. And I think that you cannot just say, yes, but this place by essence is a, a, a place of discrimination. Yes, OK. And so what? So what are we going to do now when it, once it's said? So we question. So we carry on the discussion. And we try to see, yes. In this country, the Native Americans are the First Nations in Canada. We have to talk about this because this is part of our reality. And we have to acknowledge uh, what happened in history and to understand from where, where, where we are coming from with all this discussion. And we keep on this. Uh, we keep on talking and, and, and nurturing this critical thinking because today, what is happening with our populists and the politicians, they are trying to L limit our freedom of expression within academia. In, for example, for example, we have you know the the the, the, the awareness week on Palestine and all this. Now there is a struggle on this. We can't. We don't want you to speak about this. And and it's not going. It's not going to solve the problem. It's going to push the people to be very much against uh, the academic institution. So this is why professors and students and all together we have to be clear on this but not by starting i wouldn't start the discussion with this i would start the discussion by saying at least we can start the discussion here so let us be uh, courageous enough you know what i think really is that within our universities i'm always saying this about politicians i'm saying this about citizens but i i have to acknowledge the fact that uh, in our universities there is sometimes a lack of intellectual courage so we use things like this just not to question and not to come with the critical questions to the institutions because it's a power struggle at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, I want to thank um, Professor Tarek Ramadan, of course, you know, for coming all the way. Uh, Um, that was really remarkable, as uh, I'm sure all of you experienced and were, was uh, expected it to be. I'm just very quickly, a few points that uh, I felt stuck out to me, and I'll be pondering a little more later on, is uh, the, the issue of victimhood is something um, communities are facing. We need to 
question that and get out of that mentality, the importance of cross-disciplinarity, uh, arguments that cross the boundaries and uh, uh, the boundaries of our identities. Um, a vision, creating a vision for a new way of being visible in the West, raising our cultural, our collective and individual cultural capital, decolonizing history, and uh, all of these things are very complicated. And there, there isn't a single sort of uh, answer for how these ways, these things are going to be realized. Um, uh, it's a demanding way of being, as uh, Professor Tariq Ramadan told us. It's not. It's not an easy task, but I think anything worth doing uh, thank you. takes effort. So thank you all once again for coming, and uh, thank you.